Hello everyone, can you hear me? Alright, so we're going to get the meetup started now. Uh, we have some pizza coming on the way, so that should come, you know, we'll, we'll spread it around when it arrives. Uh, but I think this is like a pretty good mass of people, so we might as well just kind of get the meetup started. Uh, as I mentioned, it's meant to be a little bit intimate, uh, and I guess it's pretty tight in here as well, so <laughs> you'll get to feel that. And we also have 10 people joining in through Zoom remotely. Uh, if you could also could say hi to them in the Zoom, just make them feel welcome. Hi! <laughs> Alright, awesome. And you know, honestly, they're probably not going to be able to hear you because it's just my, phone. <laughs> my laptop's audio, but we have some microphones around the room and we'll try to combine the audio at the end of the night and share it with everyone. Um, and then, you know, this is a really casual meetup. It's the first meetup for Handshake that we've done. Uh, you know, we, we're expecting the mainnet to launch pretty soon, and I'll talk more about that, but, you know, we thought it'd be good to get some of the members of the community more engaged and, and share more about kind of how we're thinking about things, go into a little bit more of a technical walkthrough. Uh, so the overall structure of this today is we're going to have four people speaking. Uh, it'll be myself, Mark back there, who's on the purse team, uh, Anthony, who works together with us, uh, and then uh, Mackie over here. Uh, and basically the overall structure is, you know, we'll just do a quick talk, you know, 10, 15 minutes, and then have five to 10 minutes devoted to each speaker for questions, uh, and then just kind of roll through that. And then at the end, we'll just break and you know, hopefully you guys can meet each other and talk with each other and keep it casual over a pizza. Cool, awesome. So to start off, what I wanted to talk about is essentially, uh, one, just give a quick overview of Handshake because you know, everyone here I think is in our like, subscriber email list. It's been you know, months since we've reached out last time, so give you some updates there. And, and the main thing I want to accomplish with what I'm talking about today is kind of give you a way, a framework for how to think about Handshake. Uh, handshake. Um, the, main, the main thing is that you know, Handshake is a, it's a complex protocol that can be used for many different things. And you know, there are many different narratives that you can apply in terms of you know, evaluating Handshake and, and thinking through whether it's useful or not. Uh, so I want to share those narratives that we've been using inside of our own team, uh, talk about some of the use cases, and uh, just kind of go from there. Um, so, without any more delay, basically at a high level, the way to think about Handshake, the way that we think about Handshake is, it's essentially a protocol for unstoppable names. It works very similarly to Bitcoin, right? It's, a, it's actually a fork of Bitcoin, which is a JavaScript full node for Bitcoin. Um, so it works very similarly, but instead of using the coins as money, you use the coins to register names on the Handshake blockchain. And these names, I'll talk about in a second, they have many different use cases, but they're primarily aiming to be used as top level domain names. You know, TLDs are like .com, .io, .net, .org. Uh, and with Handshake, you can register new TLDs. So Handshake is an extension to the existing TLD system. And the special thing about these TLDs is essentially these TLDs are unstoppable. Once you've registered a name on the Handshake blockchain, it's literally impossible for anyone to censor your name or seize it or tamper with it. Uh, and not only can they not tamper with your own name, but they can't pre prevent end consumers from accessing your name, right? Because as long as anyone can access the Handshake network, access one IP address in the entire network, they're going to be able to get access to these names. And another key aspect of it is, uh, you know, you, you need a little bit of DNS familiarity, familiarity to get this, but basically, because the handshake names are associated with public keys, uh, it opens up the avenue to have SSL without having to rely on certificate authorities. So right now in the existing DNS system, you have certificate authorities that are basically like, oh, when I'm visiting Facebook.com, you know, I can trust that this is actually Facebook.com and I'm not just getting redirected to some you know, random server in some other country. Uh, SSL and certificate authorities help to uh, enable that. And because of how it works, basically certificate authorities are a failure point in the security of DNS today. With Handshake, because the public keys are secured by the blockchain, you don't have to rely on the certificate authorities anymore. So that's a big security benefit that Handshake provides in addition to the unstoppable nature of the names. And then in terms of like, you know, what, what benefit this provides, right? Because like, for something like this, you really need adoption by people outside of the crypto community as well. 
And when you talk to developers, you know, some of the things that really resonate with them is really when you talk about how does it change the end user that's using Handshake. Because the cool thing about using Handshake is that once you own a name, it's you own it and no one can take it away from you. And it effectively changes your relationship with the internet. Uh, how many people here have owned a domain name before? Wow, okay, cool, a lot of you, awesome. So as you know, you can you know, rent a domain name, you, you basically lease it for a year, right? And you have to renew it every year. Uh, at the end of the day, even if you own a domain name, you don't actually own and control it. It's given to you, it's like leased to you by ICANN, it's leased to you by Verisign, they own .coms. Uh, and so if you do anything that they don't like, they can shut that down. Uh, and at the end of the day, regardless of what you're doing, you're, you're still uh, effectively just leasing the name. With Handshake, you're actually owning a piece of the internet. Uh, and that, that property that you have now, it, it changes your behavior because now you're an owner of the internet versus just a consumer. And you're free to do whatever you want with the name, right? You can create and distribute whatever content you want knowing that no one can seize that from you and no one can harm you for owning that name because you can also register these names anonymously. And so what can these names be used for? Well, there's a number of use cases that are really interesting. Uh, we think that they're much, the use cases are much broader than what I'm just gonna share right now, but these are the initial ones that are very compelling to us. Uh, first, it's you know, very obvious, Handshake can be used for the top level domain names, right? Uh, unstoppable DNS. This is a very compelling use case because this is a problem that people face uh, every day in pretty much every country outside of the US and Canada. You know, everyone's familiar with how the Great Firewall of China censors DNS there. Uh, and you know most most countries that do DNS censorship, like literally every country, the way that they do it is at the DNS level. You can do IP level censorship as well. It's just technically more difficult. It requires more infrastructure. Most people don't actually do it uh, because it's so easy to censor DNS in the first place. They just default to that. And Handshake basically removes that as an attack vector. Uh, so that's an incredibly compelling use case. And you know in terms of like a real world example of how this manifested. Uh, about a year ago, we were doing a user test. We had a conversation with someone in uh, Barcelona, and they shared this story where, you know, a year ago uh, in Barcelona, there was this population of people called the, the Catalonians, right? And they basically want to be their own country. They want to be separate from uh, Spain. And regardless of you know which side you take on the matter, uh, the objective sequence of events is like they want to hold this like vote, this referendum and try to you know, be their own nation. And so they hosted a lot of this content on IPFS, you know, data about you know, where you could vote and statistics and stuff like that. Uh, but in order to access IPFS, you need to access an IPFS gateway, right? You know, IPFS.io or whatever. Uh, the Spanish government, they were aware of this, and so what they did is they censored the IPFS gateways. So they shut down those domains so that people in Barcelona, the Catalonians, weren't, gonna, weren't able to access those resources. But if the Catalonian government had pointed people to use Handshake, this wouldn't have been a problem. It would have been impossible for the Spanish government to actually censor those domain names, and then the Catalonians would have been able to access those resources on IPFS. So you know, that, that is one of the use cases about Handshake that we're most excited about, and when we speak with developers around the world, we, we see that this resonates with them pretty clearly. Even people who aren't interested in blockchain, once they understand this, they, they get it pretty quickly and, and they like that. Another use case that is, you know, most of you guys will know is you can use Handshake to give a human readable name to crypto wallet addresses. Uh, this is cool because you know, with Handshake, no one can tamper with that, so you can associate it with your wallet address or for any blockchain, essentially, it's agnostic. Uh, and you can point people and start giving people your Handshake name instead of using a wallet address. Uh, that one though, on, on, from our perspective, it requires a little bit more top-down uh, adoption because at the end of the day you need kind of the, the wallets, right? The eToros of the world, the uh, you know wallets that people are using to integrate with Handshake. Uh, and so that is a use case that we're focused on, but it's, it's gonna take more effort from the community to get adoption on because uh, you need these partners to actually do it. Whereas with the Handshake DNS use case, that can be bottoms up. Any developer can just switch and point their DNS to Handshake Everything is backwards compatible, so you don't need to switch back. And then once you're doing that, you can just access the benefits of the Handshake DNS uh, from day one without any sort of integration or adoption. Uh, and so that lends itself much more to kind of like this like crypto decentralized movement because you can have much more of a grassroots adoption. And then finally, another interesting use case is if you've ever used Tor, you'll know that in order to use Tor, you need to find all these you know, onion URLs. You, uh, they're not really human readable, right? The beginning is maybe human readable, but the end is just this long hash. And the way that you find these URLs is you essentially have to go onto these websites or maybe a friend will send you a link uh, and they can change and, and you can't really trust them that well. 
With Handshake, you can solve this problem because now someone can register a Handshake name, point it to that Onion URL, and then now the Handshake name becomes the canonical name for that uh, website on Tor. Uh, and so it improves the safety of it and also improves the censorship resistance of it. Uh, and so that's the use case that we're, we're very excited about. And the Tor Foundation, you know, if, if you look on the Handshake website, you can see they also received a grant from Handshake. Uh, so hopefully they're a little bit more, uh, they have a little bit more skin in the game as well because now they have some Handshake coins that they can play around with. Uh, so those are some of the use cases that we're really excited about for Handshake. Cool. Yeah, so let's take about like five, ten minutes. People can just, you guys can ask me questions. Uh, and, and the way that these talks are going is basically high level to low level. So I'm speaking from a really high level perspective. Mark's a little bit less. Uh, Anthony will get more technical. And then uh, Mackie's going to do a demo of the GPU miner that they built. Um, so that's kind of the, the way to think about it. But feel free to shoot over your questions now. Yeah, so how does the consensus mechanism of this work? Is, are you using a particular blockchain for the censorship of this answer? Yeah, definitely. So Handshake is its own blockchain. Uh, it, it functions essentially very similarly to Bitcoin. They basically just added a, a new opcode that enables this auction mechanism. Uh, but it, it's its own blockchain with a, a running on proof of work. They have their own hashing algorithm. What is it? C Blake? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so they have their own hashing algorithm. And the reason why they did that is because they want to start all the miners off on the same foot. Uh, you know, basically like equal opportunity, not equal, uh, not equal outcome. Uh, so they're not trying to be like mining res ASIC resistant, but they are switching to a new algorithm that doesn't have, a, you know, they don't think has ASICs right now. Uh, so when it launches, everyone's going to be on an equal footing. Um, do, you, do you do anything to uh, make the propagation, like reading of the, uh, the DNS a little bit more decentralized? Is, yeah, like, that's the point. You need like a full node. And all yeah, that. yeah. Great question. Um, so, you know, that's, that's one of the things that's really unique about Handshake. It's the only naming chain that has its own SVB resolver. Uh, it's basically a lightweight client that takes only 10 megabytes of memory to run and virtually zero CPU. Uh, and it basically lets you trustlessly, it's a recursive DNS resolver. So it lets you trustlessly resolve these Handshake names. And because it's, you know, it has such a small footprint, that drastically increases the surface area of where you can use Handshake. Right, you can imagine you can embed it in a browser, you can put it in an iPhone, you can put it in an app, right, like a wallet, uh, put it in an embedded device if you want to. And you know, for people who don't want to even run this, they can obviously point their DNS resolver to uh, you know, a third party running Handshake resolver, but it's really, really easy to run your own uh, Handshake DNS resolver and it's like a lightweight client. Uh, and that, that makes it much easier to use. Yeah, regarding what you mentioned about owning a domain basically forever, what about the cases where you do want it to change, uh, you know, hands or where you know someone has basically abandoned something and that's a really useful address? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if you want to do a name transfer, you can do that on chain. Um, so you can you can just transfer it to another address, and so that that even enables you know like third party sales, right? You can sell your name to someone if you want, or just gift it away. Uh, and on the point about owning it forever, so you, you can own your name, your handshake name for as long as you want. You just need to submit a renewal transaction every year. It doesn't cost anything more than the normal you know, transaction mining fee. And the purpose of them doing this was that you know, if, if you lost your key, for example, they don't want that name just lost forever. Or if you know, let's say that someone becomes deceased or you know, for any reason, uh, just having this little heartbeat that you have to send every year helps make it so that the names are actually in the right hands. What happens when you don't heartbeat? Uh, yeah, so if you don't send the renewal tra transaction within the year, it basically goes back into the pool and you can just you know, open the name for bidding and, and bid on it uh, like you did originally. If it, so using the h &S points to buy a domain name that then gets burned or locked, if you don't do the renewal, do those points come back into circulation or do they no. stay locked? No, so that's like kind of how the name, so the names like have like a non-fungible nature because they're being burned into this governance state that it cannot come back from. So it allows you to maintain fungibility of the HNS token itself, which operates on the mainnet. And then when you burn a state to a covenant, then you have that name, you can transfer it, move it about, and then at any point you can, you know, like give it up and no longer want it anymore. It goes back to the network in the pool, but at no point does it ever return to that covenant state. So it's like a constant form of deflation happening on the network too as individuals burn HNS to the state. Yeah, so there's a question about the process and how it prevents early adopters and squatters from taking control of the 
That's a great question. So there are a few, you know, that's one of the other things that really differentiates Handshake. Uh, you know, it, it's similar to some of the previous incarnations of these naming projects, right? You've heard of uh, Namecoin. EMS is a little bit of a different use case, but, you know, the previous project as well. And Handshake on the technical front has the SPV resolver, which is really unique. Uh, and then they incorporated a number of mechanics that are, we think are really important for the go-to-market. So on the first aspect, you have this auction mechanic, right? So in this case, you uh, open a name for bidding, you bid on it, and it's a second price bickery auction. So what that means is, like, let's say you bid, uh, you know, 10 h on, uh, you know, uh, name base, right? And then I bid 5 h &S. If you bid 10, you won, and then you just pay 5 h &S because that's the second highest price. Uh, and then when you pay that, you're not actually paying it to any like entity or individual. You're actually just burning those coins. Um, and so you, you have to you know, pay some coins and then now the rest of the coins in circulation is, is, is lesser because you burned those coins. And, and that's how the auction mechanic works. And they wanted to prevent early adopters from being able to squat all the good names. Because you can imagine, right, like let's say six months into Handshake launch, early adopters come on board, there's no mechanisms to prevent squatting, and so now all the good names are taken up. If Handshake hasn't become the de facto DNS that the entire world uses, it's like, why would you ever want to adopt Handshake? There's, there's no point to doing that. There's no upside for you. So a mechanic that they incorporated is that they're basically doing this name drop where they're rolling out names over the course of a year. Every name, uh, every week, a new set of names is made available. And what that means is that if you come on board six months from now, you know, after the mainnet launch, you still have access to a, a good number of really good names and you can register those uh, as you want. So, so that is a cool um, mechanism for. Sorry, who asked the question? Uh, that's a good mechanism for, like, making it so that it's not an initial rush, like bang right out the door. Everyone's trying to buy all the names. But um, one of the things that really, primarily, in my opinion, prevents squatting is the Alexa or whatever the hell it is, top one hundred thousand. Sorry, yeah. Uh, sorry, the name, <laughs> the name like, I can't because yeah. of uh, the like, Amazon product thing. Um, so, uh, so, sorry, the top 100,000 domains that people use have been reserved and given to the original owners. So the reason that people can make money off squatting something is because there's a, there's a bag holder that they know wants to get that name. So most of the domain names that are high value have already been given to the rightful owners. That's one of the primary mechanisms of the people wanting to swap. I have a question yeah. uh, or a thought. Could you buy TLDs through Alexa? Like, if I'm just like, hey, Alexa, what's going <laughs> yeah, That'd be a great yeah, integration yeah, for good, someone to get product. Yeah. <laughs> what, what is the name of that service, though? It's Alexa. Alexa. The Alexa, Alexa list. They have like it's, 100K. It's, it's Alexa? Yeah. It's the same word. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> 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 Alexa is like the name of the So uh, since you don't typically browse to a top level domain like .com or .net or .org, um, how does it work in browsers? How compatible is it in browsers? That's a great question. So there are a few ways to use Handshake, uh, but the core of it is basically you can point your DNS resolver to a Handshake resolver. That can either be a third party resolver or you know the SPV resolver that you're running on your own. Uh, and you can do that at the browser level or at the operating system level or at the router level. So you know the easiest way really is for people, if you've ever used you know, Cloudflare is like 1.1.1.1 or Google's 8.8.8.8, these are you know, public DNS resolvers that people can use. And you basically just point your DNS resolver to uh, these third party re resolvers. And then your browser now knows, okay, when I'm searching for a name, where do I go to ask to find the IP address? Uh, that that uh, setting uh, basically controls that. And with Handshake, these are new TLDs, but your browsers know how to manage TLDs, so it's, it, it's basically just backwards compatible. Uh, if you register a TLD on Handshake and you, you know, add a subdomain to it and you, your browser is pointing to the Handshake resolver, it just works as normal. And the other cool thing is you can actually use the TLDs as domains themselves. So you know, for example, if I have Tieshan on Handshake, I can point Tieshan uh, that root TLD to my personal website, and I can go to Tieshan slash in the browser. And this works on Chrome. If you like, you know, we have a Chrome extension. If you want to download to just play play around with the Handshake names, you can do it pretty easily. Uh, you know, you can do that. You type in like Tieshan slash, and then it will go to uh, the personal website, just as like a normal domain name. Uh, but you know, again, the, the best way to use Handshake is really just point your DNS resolver to the Handshake resolver, uh, either your own or a third party. Yeah. 
what if the TLDs will kind of be default with Handshake, and how do you handle uh, the existing centralized TLDs? Yeah, great question. So, you know, a key aspect of Handshake's adoption that we think is really important is it's not trying to replace the existing DNS system. It's not trying to replace the existing TLDs. It's essentially an extension to the existing TLD system. So all the normal TLDs that you use, like .com and .io, .net, and everything like that, it's, it's all eff effectively blacklisted on Handshake. So no one can register them. And that means that when you go and type in you know, Facebook.com, you're still able to access Facebook, the Facebook.com that you know. Uh, and then when you type in a new TLD that's Handshake specific, that, that just goes to Handshake. Uh, and so that's, that's really how it works. It's, like, it's an extension to the TLDs. There aren't any defaults. It's really, the defaults are all the normal TLDs that you already use. And then with Handshake, you can register new TLDs that haven't been registered. Yeah, sorry. What, what if I can decide to add something new? Like, could you get a new space collision there? Yeah, definitely. Great question. So I can, can add a new GTLD, and then there would be a namespace potentially. Uh, there are two factors that kind of protect against that. One is right now ICANN isn't registering new TLDs, and we've spoken with people who worked on the original GTLD program. Uh, we're not expecting ICANN to start adding new TLDs until like 2022. So there's a bit of a time period where Handshake can get adoption. And then once they do that, they've only ever let you reg register 500 new TLDs a year. So the namespace collisions at that point will be, will be very limited. Um, and then when 2022 rolls around, let's say they start doing this and there are name collisions, it is up in the air about like, you know, what, how will this be handled, right? You can either uh, respect the ICANN version as number one or respect the Handshake version. Uh, I think it'll really depend on Handshake's adoption at that point. You know, if everyone's using this, then you know, there's, there's gonna be some sort of partnership with ICANN or something to resolve this. And then if Handshake doesn't have any adoption, then obviously the ICANN one will preside. Uh, so we'll see. Mark? We're gonna make the user experience of owning a TLD on Handshake is so much better than any person that wants to buy a normal GTLD or whatever. We just decided to buy it on Handshake instead. Uh, nobody knows or uses NetSec right now, currently, and Handshake is sort of a way to like backdoor NetSec into all DNS addresses, so it like provides like substantial like local security over regular. It's a security protocol for um, for DNS. Are you talking about like, DNS sec or NetSec? Yeah, DNS. Sorry, did I just pronounce that? You were saying NetSec. Oh, DNS sec. Sorry. Sorry. Cool. Um, so I think that was a good amount of questions, and I can answer more later. But I think Mark has to talk right now. We also have pizza here, so why don't we? How about five minute wait? Yeah, yeah, let's do a five minute break. We'll bring the pizza in, have a slice of pizza, and then Mark can set up and do his chat. Hey, so uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about Handshake. So um, one interesting thing about Handshake is that it is a collaborative manga story. So you can go on uh, handshake.org slash mascot. You could uh, participate in telling the, the manga story about uh, Handshake. So you should uh, go and check that out. Um, but uh, I don't want to waste too much time on that. So uh, let's talk about the, the protocol itself. So um, yeah, so like uh, I guess I'm just gonna kind of build a little bit. Like, please ask questions because I have no idea what levels people are at and kind of uh, what they like to get out of this. But I've just been thinking about Handshake a lot, so I'm here to like answer questions, uh, talk about kind of use cases and stuff like that. So. Um, yeah, so Handshake is a UTXO-based blockchain. So it's more similar to Bitcoin than it is to Ethereum. Um, but what makes it interesting is that it has uh, a, an authenticated tree data structure that gets committed to in all of the blocks, just like Ethereum. So um, basically, your Handshake name itself is a UTXO. And that when you have access to that UTXO, you get to write to the, uh, the value, because the, the tree is a key value store, so you can write to the value that represents, uh, or that, that is matched that UTXO. And um, every name gets 512 bytes um, in this tree. So that's kind of reason about how large 
the, the database will grow over time because that's like one of the major concerns of the blockchain is over time like you know your database will continue to grow and grow and grow and if you uh, grow too fast like it doesn't matter how scalable you are because um, you know you're just writing to the, the database faster and faster and then eventually like it'll only be able to run in the cloud instead of um, like on a really expensive machine instead of being able to run you know like on your laptop or something like that um, so yeah, so so uh, so names. Um, there's there's an on-chain process uh, to get a name, and uh, it, it's through an auction. And these auctions all are all enforced through um, what's called a covenant. And the way that I like to think about covenants is um, what it, it allows you to. Um, so like normally, like a, a a Bitcoin script, it will restrict the spending conditions of the next spend. Just one spend, and um, basically you just provide a witness, and then it evaluates alongside the the locking script that's locking that UTXO. And if it evaluates the true, then you can spend it. And um, so the idea with covenants is it adds an extra data structure to uh, an output. So an output is uh, a value. So like. How many dollar reduce? Because the the smallest uh, unit of account in Handshake is a dollar reduce, similar to like a Satoshi in Bitcoin. So an output has a value in uh, dollar reduce. It has uh, a locking script, and then also has a covenant. And the covenants allow you to restrict all possible future spends of that coin. And it's basically just like a, a, a finite state machine uh, that describes. Um, uh, like the auction process and um, so basically when you want to um, when you want to go through an auction what you do is you first um, have to send a transaction to the to the network uh, opening the auction and um, the idea is that names roll out on a weekly basis so uh, there's like a helper function or maybe there's an RPC endpoint that'll tell you like when the name rolls out. But the idea is that you don't want to congest the network with all the names at the same time because then it's just like a mad rush. Everybody's sending transactions. You'll end up with like, um, you know, Bitcoin in 2017, like at the peak of the bubble when transaction fees were too high. Um, so you don't want that. So names are released on a weekly basis and that's like calculated by something like you just hash the name, you cast that to an integer, and then you mod it by 52. Uh, so, so yeah, names come out on a weekly basis. So when a name comes out that you're interested in, you uh, tell the network that you want to open it by submitting an open transaction. And then um, you have to wait a certain amount of time. So there's this idea of like a tree interval. And what this tree interval is for is um, it's... Uh, to prevent too much um, disk IO is one, one reason. So it's kind of like a, it's like a database transaction and every so often it's committed to disk. And this is to help um, make the software like easier to run on less strong hardware. Like you don't need an SSD. Like uh, with like some blockchains you might need an SSD to be able to like keep up with it because it's just doing so much IO. So um, there's this idea of like uh, uh, the, the tree interval where every so often that, that the, the root of the authenticated tree is committed to disk. And um, oftentimes the tree interval, you have to wait until the next tree interval to, um, for, like the, for the auction state to be valid, um, which I'll get more into that. And if anyone has questions, please uh, say something. How long does the auction state last? It depends on the network. So it's a, it's a, a configurable thing, but um, between testnet and like mainnet, it's a, it's a little bit different. Um, off the top of my head, I don't know, to be honest, because I mostly run it on reg tests more than anything else. So um, yeah, we could look it up in the code base. It'd probably be pretty easy to find. It's about two weeks for mainnet. <clears throat> right, yeah, so two weeks. Um, Okay, so then, yeah, so then once you open up a name, then you have to wait until the next tree interval, and then you can then um, start bidding. 
And the idea is that um, there is a, a bidding period where anybody can submit bids, and then that is basically you're taking a UTXO and you're turning it, the covenant type, um, into type bid. And what that means is that that uh, type bid can only be spent to type reveal. So um, once you bid, you're committed to the auction. Like you can't take those coins and spend them somewhere else. They're like really only valid for that auction. So um, that the, the covenant system basically allows the um, auctions to work. So once you once you put up bids, um, everybody everybody bids. Enough time passes, then you have to spend your bids into a reveal, and then there's like this reveal period where everybody has to reveal what they bid because the bids are blinded. And then um, after uh, a certain amount of time passes, then the winner gets to uh, claim the name and then everybody else uh, redeems back and gets their money back. And uh, the winner's uh, money uh, gets burned. But then now they have a UTXO that represents that name. And when they have that UTXO, that allows them to write their DNS records into the tree, into the database. Um, you could pre-sign transactions if you wanted to, but um, I believe that you need to. Um, I believe that you need to include like a hash of like a block, or maybe that's for uh, this redeem. Is for, um, this is for the yeah, the renewals. Yeah, you need to do that for redeems. Okay, that's great. But it's renewals. another it's another two week period, so you just need to be online once yeah. in that two week period. And you could pre. There's nothing stopping you from pre-signing transactions yeah. if you wanted to. This two week period sounds like an adjustment to the like the multi investment and like how fast it's occurring. Is that correct? What's that? The, the two week period is. Uh, so, yeah, just to talk a bit about the numbers. So, there's a five day period for bidding in which new bids will be accepted. And subsequent to that, there's a 10 day period for you to reveal your bid. So, it's like five days, 10 days, two weeks. It's just a quick number to throw out. Uh, but it's, not, it's, not, it's yeah. not related to the difficulty adjustment, that number. Yeah. yeah. Uh, on the topic of difficulty adjustment, um, so it uses the same difficulty adjustment algorithm as Bitcoin Cash, and it readjusts every single block based on, I think, a moving average of like the last 144 blocks or something like that. Yeah, it uses the same one as Bitcoin Cash. Um, so it is proof of work? It's it is proof of work. Longest chain, not the longest distance. Yep. Did you describe the uh, relationship between the UTXO output and the IP address? Yeah, so um, basically the, the UTXO, that represents the name. And by having that UTXO, you then have the right, you have the right to write to the database, the authenticated tree. And that's where you put the DNS records. So you cannot write to that tree unless you hold the UTXO for that name. Because that, that tree is just a key value store. Yeah, you can store arbitrary data there. Um, so that's that's uh, uncertain. Oh, okay. that's that, that's uncertain. Policy that it has to be. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, we're, there's a little bit of. Um, so yeah, it, it's it's undecided whether or not you'll be able to store arbitrary data, or uh, if there will be like consensus-based restrictions on what sorts of records that you'll be able to store in there. Um, but yeah, you can find that discussion on GitHub if you're interested in participating in it. And you can change whatever, anytime you want, you can change it to something else if you only like that too. Yeah. So you, it's, to, to, to write to that database, you need to uh, submit a transaction to the network. And it's a, a type update. So the covenant type update um, you can you can spend a, a type update to another type update, and that's just like you up, re-updating what's held in that database. Um, but um, when you update the database, that does not get committed to disk and does not uh, become part of like consensus until the next tree interval. Yes. And you can see a history of what changed. It's not like a variety. There's a history. 
Or it's still on the blockchain. Yeah, you can file that covenant thing on the blockchain. Okay. Or but it wouldn't necessarily be part of the 10 megabyte SPV. It's just sort of like archive nodes would have that information, I guess. Yeah, you can have it like archive. Yeah, yeah. yeah. All, all party things. Well, yeah, we've got a full node again. You can't arbitrarily query, arbitrary query say what was the state of this block. Uh, yeah, right. uh, so yeah. yeah, it's a little bit we like there. It, it would be possible to write an archival node, but um, yeah, you can have a full node, but not necessarily an archival node where you could at any moment read query like what was the state at this height. Uh, that's not implemented, but it's it's possible to implement it. Um, Cool. So, um, any any questions or like comments or topics? Um, how much are transaction fees? Uh, well, that depends on how uh, much competition there is. So you can, you can each address can send one bid number. Uh, anybody can send any number of bids. Yeah, the, the, so they're hidden, um, so your price is not going to matter. Yeah. What happens if, if uh, the winning price is like a tie along a lot of different addresses? Um, that's a good question. If it's a tie, what happens in that case? Do you know? Well, probably the first. It's probably the first one that's included. Is that right? Yeah, I'm not sure. Because then the next bid wouldn't be greater or less than, so it just wouldn't change to the state. Uh, that's true, yeah. yeah. It's probably the first one to reveal, but we'd have to look at the implementation to, to know that. But that's a really good question. We should probably know that off the top of my head. <laughs> um, yeah, so what I think is really interesting about Handshake, though, is that the way that um, I think that it's it's kind of very application specific in the sense where I think that it provides a useful solution for many other peer-to-peer -peer protocols. Um, anything that needs to do service discovery of any sort, I think could use Handshake. Um, and I think that, um, is anyone familiar with like Bolt 10? It's like a Lightning Network RFC. Um, basically, it's like a way to do peer-to-peer uh, -peer discovery. When, when you start up a Lightning node, um, it needs to find other Lightning nodes to be able to connect to. So they, they're using DNS um, as, their, as one of their potential ways of doing it. And it's actually really cool because um, they, what they do is they encode query parameters as subdomains, basically. So what they do is, um, you should just look up uh, Bolt 10, like literally right in the Lightning RFC documentation. But like, let's say that you want to get like 10 uh, nodes that are IP, IPv6 that offer like these services. So what you would say is like N10 for like you know number you want 10 records, and like you know I6 this is a simplification. It's not actually like this. But I6 meaning like IPv6. So uh, N10 dot I6 dot like S4 because like you want like you know, your services, it's like a bit field and it's like four, you know, so like, and then you send that uh, that request to the DNS server and then it'll uh, pull up, pull together a bunch of records for you and send it back, right? So um, the, the problem with that is that uh, if you're doing it with traditional DNS, then, you know, you're running, if you're, if you're, if you have like, um, you know, cedarnode.com, right? If, Dot com wanted to take away your subdomain, they technically could. And then, then all of a sudden, now you're dependent on this, this uh, DNS infrastructure that just was taken out from underneath you. All of a sudden, new nodes can't connect to the network. You know, maybe it's proof of stake, and uh, you know, it was all timed perfectly so you could get slashed, you know, something like that. So the idea is that um, with Handshake, you know, as soon as you write to that database, the, the tree, like work is constantly accumulating on that. So um, it's going to take a lot of money wasted to reorg that transaction out, and then basically um, censor it from being included in a block again. 
so it's it's really hard to attack uh, like a, a DNS infrastructure that's based off of Handshake, or it's, it's at least harder to, uh, in my opinion. Uh, so that's where I think Handshake is really, really uh, going to be useful for any anybody that has some sort of P2P protocol that needs to do peer discovery. Uh, How does uh, Handshake um, prevent against uh, denial of service attacks? Or does it? Um, so I guess there's lots of different types of denial of service attacks. So, um, like, for example, so Handshake is based on SPV security. So the idea is that, like, no one is going to, not everyone in the world wants to run their own full node. Like, that's just, like, if you've been in Bitcoin long enough, you know that that's not going to happen. Like, some people just don't care enough. They just want to be able to, like, use it, and it's whatever. It just works. They don't want to think about it, and just have, they just want to, to like do cool things for them. So um, the idea is that you can like run a light client that basically just keeps track of all the headers, and then you can um, you can set that as your DNS server, and then you can then uh, the, the light client itself will ask for proofs over the P2P network. So you can run a light client that doesn't have to download all the blocks, um, and like you can have uh, pretty good security, uh, like SPV level security. Which is is everyone familiar with SPV? It's like in the Bitcoin white paper. Cool. Um, yeah. So um, one potential for a denial of service attack is if not enough people are running full nodes and everybody's running light nodes and everybody's using the light nodes, then your full nodes are basically like proof servers to the light nodes. Because you're sending DNS requests to the light nodes, the light nodes have SPV security, so they need to ask for uh, proofs from full nodes and um, yeah, basically you just wanna make sure that your full node isn't getting too many pings all the time, uh, preventing you from like validating blocks and doing consensus. So what if I set up a botnet to ping the full nodes all the time? Um, you, should, you, should, you should do that. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, it would, it would then prevent the light nodes from... Yeah, you could do the same attack on Bitcoin if you had enough. You know, I mean, eventually you, a year up, you eventually start getting banned. Right, right. Uh, so the, good, the good thing there's a thing that like, kind of prevents that from other call factors. So you have like the, the root zone file, right, that's like maintained every time like the state is updated, right, whenever you change your, uh, you know, servers and et cetera. So like that root zone file, you can basically just like dump that file. And then when you basically like, for instance, you can have like a, an actual zone that exists on the existing DNS that requests or gets a full file, an HNS node that maintains or hits the map of the last updated like zone file. So even if you're like attacking the network, trying to toss it, hitting all the full nodes, as long as a file exists somewhere and the integrity of the chain is still intact, at some point you'll always be able to make it back. Yeah. Um, so there's this idea of like having a peer score, where um, any peer that you connect to, you like score how good of a peer they are, and you can ban peers if they start being not nice. So if you start sending way too many requests, then you'll get banned and then you won't be able to reconnect. Um, so like that part of that is like part of the noise protocol, similar to like what Lightning uses. So uh, Android uses the same noise protocol on the peer-to-peer -peer layer. So they're sending like encrypted messages when you're going to like resolve games. So if you act up funky, you start requesting a lot of information from the and stuff like that. Those are their own threshold in the configuration path, right? Um, once you're that threshold, you see bank. Uh, I was just gonna say that you sort of asking Seed nodes, 
So if you try to, if you point at your bot net to see nodes, you could prevent new people from connecting to the network with a perfect DOS, but you wouldn't prevent the network as it is from existing. So, and that would that would keep, and that would mean that all SPD works just fine. Um, and so you would spend a lot of money to DOS to prevent newcomers, but really not stop the whole network. Whereas that much money could be used to DOS verify very easily. So I would say that it's like substantially more DOS resistant given that. Makes sense. Okay, cool. So another thing that I think is pretty interesting is um, kind of like the security of the internet, if you think about it, is kind of like um, a one of many multi-sig in the sense of you having a ton of uh, like, C, like certs like on your machine. And the idea is that um, if you go to any website, then as long as one of the certs on your machine uh, is like within the root of trust, because all the certs on your machine are part of uh, like the root of trust, they're down the chain. So if you, if you go to any website that is signed, that has signed the cert uh, that comes from that website, and it's that, that, let me rephrase it. So any of the certs that are on your machine, if they signed a cert that came with the website, then it's considered secure, right? But there's been times in the past where uh, these certs were hacked and like offered like uh, basically fake signatures. Like I think the infamous one is Google in like what, 2013 or something? Yeah, so um, there's like very much like this like tree structure in the way that the authority works and trust on the internet. So we think that it's possible to kind of flatten it out from being a tree to being something like that, that's just generally more flat. And there's like a few different uh, DNS RFCs that we'd like to see more adopted. And uh, one of them is it's all called Dane. And what Dane lets you do is it lets you specify the hash of like, I think it's your subject public key info that's in your X509 cert. You can hash that, put it in as a DNS record, and then basically say, um, you know, you can trust my cert if the hash of the subject public key info matches this hash in this record, right? So it's a better way of, uh, of doing things, in my opinion, because you can say, um, you know, trust like what I'm giving you, and this is what I'm going to give you. And instead of like having this like weird one of many multi-sig construction that could get hacked at any point in the tree, um, so it just removes more factors. Um, so. Um, that is currently not supported in browsers, but we really hope that um, it gets more support eventually. So it could be uh, used for like backend service discovery for something like Bolt 10. Um, but for serving websites, like um, I think Namecoin has the same problem, and I believe that they have like a little server that you have to run on your machine that talks to a Chrome extension. So it's not ideal, like. Like normal users aren't going to deal with that. Um, so yeah, more work needs to be done um, regarding Dane um, and uh, making DNS a little bit uh, easier to use and removing all the points of value like up that whole tree. How do you spell that Dane? D A N E. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. It. I think it'd be really cool to uh, implement something like. We need to really, I feel like, um, uh, what is it? Um, like, I feel like Firefox might be, might want to help, or maybe Opera. Like, we just need to get into a browser, really. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't, um, you, you would need to register an SSL certificate, and uh, I'm not, I, I haven't figured out how to, how to really do that yet, personally. Yeah. So if somebody knows how to do it, then that would be cool, but, um, like, I don't think it'll work with Servot, 
because like it would need to. Yes, Sir Bob would need yeah. to have a. Uh, like it would a, need to be able to DNS look up you and. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so. Um, They're not writing it there. Well, I guess, do you, do you, would you need an SSL certificate? Yes, you would. And, uh, so Handshake guarantees that the person you're talking to is the person you wanted to be talking to. Like the person, like if you're talking to Google Doc, you know, Google or whatever, the person who owns that name is the person that you're talking to. But another thing that TLS provides, or SSL, is encryption so that nobody along the way can see what you're talking to them about. Um, and so that's sort of something that we need to come up with. Uh, yeah, and that's, that's where Dane would be useful. Is if Dane was widely adopted, then it would solve this problem. Yeah, Namecoin has some really cool experiments around it over in their, uh, in their GitHub org because they have the same problem. Uh, I think they have some solution for it, but I'm not super familiar with exactly what it is. Yeah, there's a couple, there's a lot of different things that you can do because uh, you, you basically like, can rely on cryptography from and we can like re-implement SSL so that it just uses the like public key cryptography of, um, of handshake and then it would just use handshake addresses for the security. But that would you know, be a lot of work and you'd have to get browsers to implement it. Any, any other questions, comments, things? If you set your DNS uh, you know, server to, to Handshake instead of a typical or your normal DNS, um, what's what's the pipeline for like, you know, okay, this is not a Handshake address, this is a normal DNS address, so what, what normal DNS provider do you use at that point? Um, it recursively resolves back out, I believe, to, is it 1.1.1? .1 .1 .1? I don't, I'm, I think, oh, I think it goes to, um, I know that it recursively resolves back out into the legacy system, but I don't know exactly, off the top of my head, I can't remember which. It's interesting to have that be configurable. Maybe some, some person says, like, you know, I want to use Handshake, but I'd rather use Google. Well, so, so how it works is DNS and already type uh, hierarchy, right? And so it's like a, like, server will say, oh, I don't know who wants this server, and that server will like, I don't know who wants this server. I think I think that you might be able to configure your hints. Yeah, sure. I mean, it's open source, so it's like at some point it's configurable. It doesn't matter how easily. Yeah, because it defines like there's a new configuration file. Like I think it's etsy.hns.com, etsy slash hns.com or something. Um, I'm pretty sure that you can put like uh, your root hints in there. Cool. Let's uh, give it up for Mark. Awesome. That's great. Thanks. We have two more <coughs> quick talks, uh, Anthony and then Stephen with Minor. So let's go into it. Yeah, cool. Hey, everyone. My name is Anthony. I'm with Namebase. And it's going to be a brief talk about an interesting topic for Handshake, which is the security of the names and how should we be thinking about that. So I'm just curious, like, quick show of hands, how many people here, like, custody some of your own crypto? And then a mobile wallet, hardware wallet, air gap machine, something like that. Um, so it's an interesting problem when it, when it comes to names. Because one of the nice properties about cryptocurrencies is that they're fungible. If I'm spending five Bitcoin, if I had that much Bitcoin, uh, then it's pretty easy for me to store the bulk of that in some cold wallet. It's like locked up, it's in a safe, it's a multi-sig, air gap machines only. And I can have some tiny, tiny portion for my day-to-day -day spending that's hot. Unfortunately, if you try to apply this to a name, it kind of breaks down. Like, what does it mean to store a name cold? I need to be able to change my name's resource records, change the IP address, change the name servers. But at the same time, I don't want those keys to live on some hot device so that an attacker that compromises my laptop, my hardware wallet, my et cetera, et cetera, can access this. So thankfully, Handshake has some creative solutions that make it uh, very easy for you to have very fine-grained control on the exact level of security for your name. 
So when we talk about stealing a name, there's a few different threats here to consider. So the first most obvious threat is name theft. So someone gets your keys sufficiently to transfer your name to a different address. So they can get full ownership of your name, they can change where it's pointing, they can change if anyone can even access it. So this is transferring. There's another threat, which is changing where their name is pointing. So you can imagine some crazy attack, you spin up a service, it's only accessible by a handshake. People type it in, they make accounts, they put, maybe it's an e-commerce service, and now someone compromises your name, they point it to their servers, and essentially try and fish your users. And this happens a lot on, you know, like, onion, like, hidden services. Uh, so, bad attack, because now your users compromise that way. So there's all these different incentives that attackers may have to steal your name, whether that's griefing, whether that's trying to extract some sort of profit from your name. And with Handshake, as, as Mark, you know, great overview, as Mark talked about, Handshake has a covenant system. It turns out there's 13 different things you can do with a name, whether that's bidding on a name, if it's still in the auction process, that might be revealing or redeeming or registering, it might be transferring a name. Um, and there's another interesting one, which is revocation. So one of the features that Handshake implemented to disincentivize attackers is the idea of burning a name, like burning a name, getting rid of it. I have my key that controls it, the attacker has their key, but sorry, bud, like it's gone. Like neither of us have it now. So this disincentivizes attackers from trying to expend you know, millions of dollars stealing thousands of names if the true owner can then just burn those names. So Handshake's solution to this is the inclusion of a new opcode called optype. So Handshake added this covenant system to support name auctions, and they added this opcode, optype, to support this fine-grained control over the security of your names. And it's very simple. All optype does is it looks at what you're trying to spend your name into, what type of covenant. Are you trying to spend it into an, an update covenant, which means you're changing your name service, you're changing IP. Are you trying to spend it into a transfer covenant, which means you're giving it to someone else. And it pushes that onto the stack, and that's it. And now the rest is essentially the exact same as Bitcoin script. And with this small little change, we can do some very interesting things. Because now what we can do is we can construct new kinds of uh, redeem scripts that look like um, if the next covenant is a transfer, then you need a five, satisfy this five of six multisig. If the next covenant is a revocation, you need this 10 of 10 multisig. And you can manage those keys at all these varying levels of security to have the, the, the big assurance that the only things that are hot are the things that I really need to be hot. For instance, renewals. It probably doesn't matter if someone renews my name for me. It's like, honestly, like, thank you that you paid my network fee. Uh, it might matter a little bit more if transferring is hot. So we've done a lot of thinking about this for ourselves at Namebase, but it's, it's really interesting to think about it from the personal stance as well. Because I like to think about this from the perspective of how secure are my existing domain names that I own? And the honest answer is like not, not that secure. If you access my, let's say it's a Namecheap name, if you access my Namecheap account and I'm still, you know, my DNS is still set up with Namecheap, you can either just change those name servers or just change all the AP addresses of the A records, the C name records. Um, but when you get to a scale where you're managing, say, like many, many names, it's a much scarier problem because this is essentially the entry point to all of these services that will eventually be hosted on Handshake. And it's essential that people are aware of the security trade-offs of having hot keys managing everything uh, or splitting it up in this more fine-grained fashion. So it's, I don't believe there are uh, any wallets out right now for uh, personal usage to, that allow you to have this like, fine-grained control, maybe, maybe no more. Uh, but this is definitely something that would be great for the community to have, which is a wallet that allows you to say, manage your own names in this like, very, very fine-grained way. And the target audience for this isn't necessarily your, your average person owning handshake names. Because you know, as I mentioned before, for most people, if you're managing domain names, that, that in itself is already not a very secure thing. Unless, of course, you've gone to a much greater length. You're with like, the best registrar. You, you've gone to great lengths to make sure that no one person can control your, all the IP addresses your domain points to. So unless you're that kind of individual that's already managing your names to this extent, maybe if you're at some you're a large company and it's essential that your names are secure, um, this isn't something that's, that's of concern. But now, for the first time, we have the possibility to own this small part of the internet and like, truly own it for ourselves. Because when you think about Handshake and compare it to traditional DNS, there's one big thing that's missing, which is this human-to-human -human, like, recourse, like this legal recourse. If I just talk to, say, VeriSign and say, hi, I have a $10 billion company and our name just got stolen, please give it back. Um, they, they have options there. Whereas with Handshake, everything's just cryptography. 
Like, if it's on the network, it's not on the network, like, that's it. That's the end of the story. You can't just cry and complain to anyone and get your name back. Change your name. You have to change your name. That's, that's essentially the, the main recourse you would have. Um, and, you know, we build up all these attachments to our names. So you probably don't want to do that. Um, so these are important questions to start thinking about now before these names start to accrue a significant amount of value. And thankfully, we have the tools to make sure these things are safe from the beginning, but a lot of that infrastructure has, has yet to be built by the consumers. Yeah, does anyone have any questions about these things? Just trying to spur, like, interesting thoughts about what does it mean to make sure my name is safe? Like, what is the user experience for this? Uh, for the end person controlling uh, some asset in a wallet? Because what? Yeah, go for it. Uh, so you talk a little more about the bird thing. So, sorry? The bird thing. You talk a little more about the bird thing. Yeah, yeah, revocation. Why sure. Would you the yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Great question. Um, so let's suppose that I own um, I own a hundred names. In aggregate, those names are worth a million dollars. And maybe some of those names are being used, some of them aren't. But somehow people find out I'm managing this on some tiny, tiny server. It's in my home. Uh, packages aren't necessarily up to date. And some hacker hears this and says, huh, if I can hack this guy's computer, I can get a million bucks in names. I'll just transfer all those handshake names out to a wallet that I control. I'll go, I'll sell those, na sell those names at some you know, dark market or whatever. I get a million dollars of clean cryptocurrency that no one is going to be able to track, and this person just lost all of their names. So you have a, you're basically putting a rather large target on your back if you're owning all these assets, and they're set up in such a way that if someone steals, say, one hot key, they get all of it. But what Handshake did is they added on this new covenant state, uh, this revocation state, which allows you to make it so that incentive no longer exists. So you can imagine as maybe a wealthy individual with many, many names, or say a large company with a lot of names, you can tell people, we have a policy, and if we get hacked, if we get our names stolen, those names immediately get burnt. So don't even bother hacking us for reasons of profit, it's not gonna work out for you. Which is really interesting, because when we talk about security, when we talk about threat modeling, it's never in terms of, I promise you this is 100% secure. I promise you this will never happen. It's always in terms of, you know, if someone spent $400 million, they could hack us. If someone spent $100,000, they could hack us. It's usually in terms of some number like that. So when you tell a hacker, hey, there's a million dollars of incentive to steal Anthony's names, then that puts a target, that puts a cost. And if they can figure out how to hack you for less than that amount of money, they'll do it. But the second you say you're going to profit exactly zero from this, that essentially excludes large swaths, like a, a large array of attacks that people would even bother considering. And essentially, the one incentive that remains for these attackers is griefing, or denial of service, or spite. Exactly, spite. So, you know, be a good person, don't make anyone spite you, and then your names will be 100% safe. So then the company loses those names? Yes, yes. But that seems to be what the issue for the company, right? Couldn't the hackers use that to blackmail companies as well? Yeah, they could, they could. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So the, the threat model changes a little bit there, but you're, you're exactly right. They cannot sell it, but they can just have that um, policy. So if, if as a company you say, we will not, we don't do that. We will not pay a ransom for a name. It's burned immediately. That's actually enforced by code. We detect it. It's in an address we don't control. That immediately gets burned. Um, now the only incentive is griefing. Yeah. So, so the replication is something you stored when you originally got the name. Sorry, say that again. The replication is implemented with something that you, a secret that you stored. When somebody, in, in real life, when somebody steals something from you, they take it from your possession. In the computer world, when somebody steals from something from you, they copy it. And so basically the point of revocation is that if you have a copy of the keys, you can destroy the underlying value of those keys. So if somebody steals, if somebody makes a copy of your key, and they try to use your key to spend all of your money, you can use, you, you can use your key. But they could steal the keys and then threaten to revoke your yeah. domains. Yes, yeah. exactly. That might be exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. the point of the sorry, the fact of the matter is that you want to prevent your keys from getting stolen. Yeah. Right? This is basically once your keys are stolen, you have some recourse and then you can destroy the value of your key now. Yeah, it seems like you should deal with if you're running a security based system which is using the key for security because you prevent the illicit use of it. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. You don't want it to get stolen. Oh yeah. Better than like it's stolen. Stolen. It is stolen. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Don't let it get stolen. <laughs> it doesn't prevent it from getting stolen. Exactly. And one nice thing about this feature is it's actually a decision that you as a name owner get to make. So you could opt into this system of revocation. Um, you could also construct your your redeem script in such a way that no one can revoke. 
And so we, we've done some thinking about that. I'm curious to chat to some of you about this, you know, like later today. But consider this. We can just make it so I, I win some name and I construct that output using the op type opcode in such a way that no single person, no key in the world will ever revoke this name. So now even if someone stole it, they can no longer blackmail me and say, hi, we have your key. We're going to revoke it unless you pay us $1,000, million, whatever. Um, all they can do now is potentially change, um, change your IP settings, you know, change your name servers. So if I steal your key, why don't I transfer the name? Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, yeah, great question. So transferring your name takes three days, and that's done very intentionally for this exact purpose. So there's, there's three, three covenants that matter here. So there's transfer, there's finalize, which can only happen about three days after, and this is what solidifies the name uh, as belonging to the new owner. But there's also cancel. So cancel is rather interesting in this discussion because why would you ever cancel? Just don't transfer in the first place. Why would you allow the person to change their mind in a three-day period? Um, so this is to stop that kind of attack where perhaps I disabled replication and I just don't want to allow uh, transfers anymore. So now you just watch the network every three days just make sure you're canceling, canceling, canceling every transfer. Um, so there's one, one other option you have if your keys get stolen, which is you can transfer it to another wallet that you control. Um, but the challenging thing here is that attacker will just cancel all of your transfers. So it, it'll basically be impossible for you to get something through. Uh, so you know, if, if you're persistent, just keep submitting these transfers and maybe one day they'll get tired and allow your transactions to go through. Exactly, exactly. Is there any uh, Oh, wait, Marcus is Marcus. I think he's not. Uh, but he had mentioned uh, like a DAO owning a TLD. Mm -hmm. So uh, would that be a, a mitigation against like a single point? Oh, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. So definitely, multi sigs will always like help with your security here. So if you can say that to update a name's name server or IP address or you know C name record, you needed a three of five multi sig, then that already like you're. For, unless for like very special circumstances, it's probably way too expensive to, to steal that from you. Is that something that a uh, name base would offer as a premium service? For uh, <laughs> multi sig. Oh, definitely. So this, in terms of our own security, like a lot of what I'm discussing, we think a lot about because we're managing all of these names. So absolutely, like our names are stored in like the safe way, so that you just doesn't have to worry about that as much. Yeah, who's asking if you can like turn that into a paid service? Ah, yeah. Need well, anything? Well, I mean. Yeah. Yeah, go for it. Um, when it's burned, is the uh, association to the whatever the data is, is that permanent? Or ah, is yeah, that good question. Good question. Uh, so when I say burned in this sense, burned of a name, what I mean is that name is now open for bidding once more. So I think this is true. I'd have to, to double check the code, but I believe that after your name either expires, there's like one year, 18 months, I forget. There's like a, some period of time at which your name expires. I think the last resource record that you had associated with your name persists until someone changes it. I don't know if anyone else here has, has a better sense. Um, so, so if you forget to renew your name, as long as no one else buys it, no one else changes those settings, it's still there. So if your name got burned until there's another winner, that, that will still work for you. Um, is, is there a way to maybe commit a domain to, say, an IPFS hash in perpetuity and not be able to change that ever? In to make it permanent? Uh, permanent? Go for it. Yeah. Sorry, what's it called? Uh, the, 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 like once every year thing. Yeah, the renewal? Yeah. You just have to fund it, but you could like, run the keys, and then it's... Yeah. Fun, yeah, so fun. yeah, good, great question, great question. Someone funds it. Yes, yes. So I haven't confirmed this for myself, but I am fairly certain that you can make it so that um, anyone can renew for you. I don't know if you know if this is true or not, uh, but at the very least, you can have a key that's pretty hot that allows you to renew your name, and just make sure you don't lose that key. And then make it so every other key, like you said, um, if you want to do it in perpetuity, make sure no one can ever change it, you can just destroy your update key. Or you can make it so to redeem to an update that actually is not something you're, you're allowed to do. In which case, it's essentially locked in, not even you can do that. Yeah, there's sort of a built-in difficulty in using handshake, and then you have to have a server like do something every year. Yeah, um, yeah. So that's where businesses like they basically make it really convenient. Be like, oh, you don't have to do shit, so I'll keep the server online. Yeah. Do you know if it is possible for anyone to pay the fee, or does it have to be? Do you have to? I'd say I'm like seventy percent sure you can do that. Mark, maybe you know. Uh, can I? Can you set your uh, redeem script such that anyone can renew for you? Anyone can redeem. Renew. 
Oh, anyone can renew. You have to use your, your original keys in order to like, go through the running process, right? So I would imagine. That's true. So it's susceptible to a wrench yeah, attack then? Uh, I, I, I think that that's possible. Yeah, actually, I think, I think you can. Because, because, uh, yeah. You can just set up a script. Or just like true. Yeah, well, well, you want to be careful because you only want that code path to be, you only want it to be triggered if you're renewing. Like, you don't basically want to create a script that just evaluates the true, because then like somebody might try to spend true in a way that you're not intending. So you have to want to you want to think about it. Oh, yeah, renew. Yeah, you want to make sure that you're renewing. Yeah. That script can only renew. But I do think it's possible. Yeah. yeah. So then you can achieve something along the lines of what you're saying. Um, so there's one more, uh, I guess, like primitive you can call that I wanted to talk about, which is. Uh, so because Handshake is, you can, for all intents and purposes, think of it as doing a lot of what Bitcoin can do. Uh, you can have time-locked transactions. So one, one thing you can imagine using this for is, I honestly think that for most people, the thing you should worry about is not your keys getting hacked, getting stolen, it's, it's you losing them. I think that's, that's much easier to happen for like, the average person than for you to be a target with sufficient value to, to warrant some sort of hack. And one nice thing you can do with this time-locked transaction is you can say, all right, maybe everything is three of five, but after one year, it's one of five. And any one of these keys that I still may have can move this name to a new address, which gives you some, some great options. If you're, maybe you just got a little unlucky, maybe all your assets got seized at some border somewhere, um, now you can still have access to your name after a certain amount of time. Open for questions, anything. Great. Great. Thanks, everyone. We'll, we'll chat later. Thank you. 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 Um, kind of like all the nuance, like trade-offs, edge cases, etc. So kind of the really important part when you're going to launch a public chain is like generally like the product. What everyone, what is, ev what is it that everyone will see? And like how do you easily technically rock what it is Handshake is trying to do? So that being said, um, since there is a formal Handshake foundation, which will dissolve upon the uh, launch of mainnet, um, we took it upon ourselves with some of my other partners to, which I'm about to go over, to formulate the Handshake Alliance. So it is a entity list, like kind of like think of it like the for-profit coordination mechanism, where everyone has their own loosely coupled entity, their own business component, and everyone wants to adhere to the future success of not only the internet but the handshake blockchain itself. So, like that being said, you know we've come together with quite a few teams with three core, like four core purposes: like the, building the community, educating the generalized community on handshake, providing adoption, and like helping to like generally like support the network as a whole. And like that, so like when people have questions about integrations, how to work with Handshake, how like basically how we're all doing in this room, they need someone to come to. So that being said, we have been working on a slew of different projects, and this doesn't even touch kind of like everything here, but I'm going to try and showcase some of them today to show you just how mature Handshake will be on day one. We'll put it probably in the same threshold as maybe like Zcash, which has now been out for two years, three years now since 2016. I like to put us on the same like kind of like moderate threshold as like that level of maturity upon launch, and I'll touch on more on that in a second. So we have multiple different um, kind of like projects here. Like I said, we have got HNS Scan, which is a block explorer, which I'll show you briefly. HNS Pool, which is the front end uh, dashboard for the HNS Pool, which will be launching here in the United States, which we're very excited about. I'll go more on that soon. Handshake Academy, which is like the resource, like learning, like center when you want to learn about Handshake. Namian, which is just a cool, like centralized, like service to get like notifications when names become available in the network. Get a little text message from like Twilio, let you know when it's time to go bid on a name. Um, Handshake Community, which is the community that we started it from us, the name-based guys, the Bitcoin team, everyone just trying to like have a central point of like discussion, like kind of like initially, kind of like Bitcoin talking, etc. Uh, and then like links to like the, the, the general like documentation. So like collaborators, myself, I'm CEO of Momentum, uh, our hedge fund, uh, Urkel Labs, which is another company that we incubated, uh, which is building the APIs, the mining pool, and the mining like software itself for Handshake. 
um, HN Symbol, which is building the uh, iOS client uh, browser uh, for managing handshake names, which will launch on, a, uh, on mainnet as well. Provide client services, node infrastructure connects, the layer two um, system for state channels on Ethereum. I'm an advisor for that company, and we're trying to bridge them on to kind of bridge like public chain UTXO like blockchains with like state channels. Um, Keocan, which built MetaMask, the Spank Pay wallet, a whole bunch of other projects. We built the, uh, the Bob wallet and the Apex resolver from Max, which I'll also demo to you very quickly. Um, and then, of course, Namebase. And so we've all been coming together to, myself, I've been in the space now for like seven years, if you don't know who I am. And I've like helped launch a lot of chains, a lot of projects, uh, have a, I like to say, pretty successful track record on knowing like how to make like crypto pull. And so I'm going to try and showcase why I feel that Handshake is ready for that. Um, so without further ado, let's start with just like the nitty gritty of like the command line. So obviously you're going to want to like fire up your HSD nodes, and hopefully everyone can see that stuff. Let me try and yeah. How's that? Nice. I good? Okay, cool. All right. Digger? Okay. How's that? Okay, all right, wait, wait, just for you, Mark. There we go. All right, all right, cool. You're welcome. So we're gonna go ahead and just like CD into HSD, and then I'm going to like so the the README to set up all this stuff, the nice fancy guide to set up your node and all that stuff. That'll all be on Handshake Academy. So for right now, I'm just gonna breeze through it and assume everyone here has probably fired up a node before. Um, so I'm gonna run this with a particular like kind of like string of commands here, which will allow the node to like also like you know store transactions and also be able to like hit the stratum accordingly. So I'll run that and it'll immediately start like syncing like the chain. All well and good. I need a version of HSD to like get block tech built in order to like do a solo miner on my computer, right? So uh, for the sake of this talk, we're gonna go ahead and just kind of close out of the miner and like kind of just say what have you to that, we'll leave that alone for now. The bread and butter of everything is going to be the handy miner uh, cli. So we're gonna go to CD, handy miner, which I've already pre-configured to work with a remote node immediately start binding on the network. It's gonna start loading its first block template for the CT CPU. We're using an open CL implementation that we've built over the last nine months for works on both NVIDIA and AMD, Windows, Linux, and Mac. And this is the command line interface for that. Right now it's building the template. It will start looking for blocks in a second. I've set the intensity for the miner to four. It'll start comparing not sets. And it'll, this, this is working right now on testnet four. We'll probably find a block in a couple of seconds. I'm gonna let it do that. So essentially, you know, we knew that people are gonna obviously immediately go to a command line interface when they wanna mine, because that's what they're most familiar with. But we also understood that there is a, there's a lot of UX improvement for mining, um, especially when you're trying to bootstrap a proof of work network and improve distribution. So we worked to further like, you know, abstract the complexity of firing up, going to command line, even though what I just did was extremely simple. Um, you know, the, the idea of like installing dependencies and things of that nature can be kind of scary to folks that just wanna you claim that everyone, one GPU is one vote, everyone wants to be a miner on this network, then everyone should have the same like level of ability to be able to join a network, right? So it's still looking for nonces. Right now it's firing at like 5.2 mega hashes. It's set at about probably like 40, 50% um, uh, uh, like performance right now. Uh, normally get about seven or eight mega hashes. This is an AMD 560. Um, so essentially this would keep going, keep going, and eventually we say boom, boom, uh, congratulations, you've like found a block like Dollary do. It'll take just a moment. Uh, I'm gonna leave that going in the background for a second here. And I'm gonna show you the uh, Block Explorer. So HNS Scan is a Block Explorer that we use and created for Handshake here. I'm gonna make it, that's really ugly, I'm gonna make it black again. There we go. So you kinda see like generally, I'm sorry if the uh, the text isn't the best. Um, it looks good? Oh yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. So essentially, you know, you know, you can get a, a breakdown of the network hash rate, everything's going on, recent transactions, blocks, that's all well and good. Um, if you want to like check on like the current status of like the node, if you're like, you know, gonna be like pinging us for like information and whatever, you know, say you're like running scripts or um, you have your, uh, I don't know, like a stats website and you're pulling it, you can pull it directly from HNS scan. Um, you can see all the peers that are currently like up uh, live on the network and where those nodes are. Currently right now we're very busy in the United States working on Handshake, as you can tell, on testnet 4. Now, now we have like also like a claim your airdrop tool, which we'll probably talk about this more in the future, but this is just if you already have coins assigned you either as an investor or from the faucet, you can paste your address of your public key that you created for the claim, and then 
the, the chain will then mine that transaction from the root, um, excuse me, from the tree, and then from there your, name, your money will be available in your name. And you can just come to HNS Scan as easy as paste your address, confirm, claim, done, and have it all there without downloading any software, which is really dope. So we'll come back over here to the terminal. Let's go over here to the miner. He still hasn't found a block yet. He's still living his best life. Um, we're going to go ahead and just scroll out of this. Control C. Close him. Hold on. It's going to hang out for a second because it's connected to the display. So give me one moment. All right. There we go. All right. So we'll close out of there. So you kind of see, like, you know, generally what is uh, like going on with the miner. You know, command line, it would come up. It would say you had a block. Go to your Coinbase address. Uh, if you're connected to a stratum, um, which we have eight stratum, um, then your shares would be, like, allocated, you know, portionally, and then your payouts would go, like, what have you. Um, so if you're not familiarized with, you know, mining, like, all that stuff probably seems, like, kind of, like, a lot. So that being said, you know, we are creating a pool here in the United States, and we want to make it as easy as we can for people to get up and mining on Handshake. So we built some things. Um, so we built first the Handy Miner itself, which has this beautiful GUI that pops up and loads for you. Thank you. Um, and then we'll just give it one second here. So uh, let me go ahead and close out all these instances so it's not running against my HSD. And so it's really simple. You fire up the GUI, Mac and Windows. HSD is already bundled with the software. We have another full client implementation, RSD, which is written in Rust, which will also be bundled in another version of Miner. So we have fault tolerance on day one on the network where we're running two concurrent full node implementations. Um, and then, of course, the SBB light client and all that good stuff. So that's awesome. But um, on top of that, you know, this makes mining super easy. So you can literally just go into your, your command line, I mean, excuse me, your, your configs, set your, your manufacturer, AMD, your GPU platform, zero or one. Zero would be your onboard uh, GPU if you have like an integrated like Intel chip, and then one would be your discrete unit. Um, so then you choose like which of your GPUs you want. Like if you have multiple, you know, in an array or whatever, you can select all those. If you don't know what GPUs you have, we have got this fancy little thing here. I'm not going to click it, but you can click query GPU IDs. It'll run a little loading screen and it'll tell you like what are your IDs for all of your different names. Basically, it runs like CLI info in the background and like lets you know like what your uh, the system's pulling up driver wise. Um, and then of course we have you can set your intensity for the miner itself. So you can set it for between one to ten. Um, and so clearly, if you're running like an actual pool. You're going to want to put it up to 10. You want to use a full pirate GPU. If you want to use some fancy back-end magic that we have on our miner, you put it up to 11. <laughs> um, and of course, this is just so if you're an enthusiast, maybe you play Dota, maybe whatever, you have a nice desktop rig, you want to mine Handshake passively in the background, you can still do that and set the threshold of what you want to put to the network. Now, like that being said, you can have all that stuff saved. And of course, then you want to decide, how do you want to mine? Do you want to mine to a pool, or do you want to mine solo dolo? So, you can, you can go to the mining details, you can put in your stratum, you can put in like your, uh, your port, all that stuff, and, like, and, and set your initial pool difficulty. Our stratum and all that stuff is going to be preloaded into for HNS pool. So you literally just like click save, save, and it will automatically start mining to our pool. You don't even need to think about it. The only thing you need to set is your, like, your Coinbase payout address to the wallet, um, which I'll show you how super that will be in just a second as well. Um, so once all that stuff's done, done, we're going go to two, we're gonna go to mining mode, we're going to go to solo pool mining. We're going to connect to a remote node, because I'm sure everyone else has probably synced a, a node here before, and I don't want to get caught up with any weird dependencies. So everything's here, connected to the host, connected to the stratum. I've got this one-time username password. It's, it's all BS anyways. And it immediately starts mining. So um, that's it. Um, works just like that on Windows and Mac. Um, Linux, you're still using the command line interface. The minor logs will show up here. It'll initialize the HSD installation. What it's doing there, it's, do, it's making a decision tree. It's saying, can I, from the bundled HSD node, validate the previous 100 blocks on the network as a means to also secure the network? Or if there's, there's a failover that's handwritten too. So if we cannot connect to our local HSD bundled node, securing the network by creating another full node, you will fail safe over to our remote node and immediately get your block template from us. So you won't get any weird errors, nothing, anything like that. As long as your dependencies and everything are installed, you click this on this, you're done. You don't even need to think about anything. So um, it'll get going. Uh, it'll, it'll take about you know, 10 or 20 like, seconds. So, like, is, that, get, is that Bob? Huh? Is that Bob? That, uh, no, that, this is just the GUI. Oh, no, I mean the cat. Oh, yeah, that's cat. That's cat Bob. <laughs> um, and then so you know, you, we also see like, you know, the, the difficulty of the last blocks here. Um, the hash rate of the network, you can click into here and it'll take you to a little mini version of HNS scan. And you can see in here that you can like see the last block, what, what, you know, everything that you came in, and track all your stuff from here. 
We're extending the GUI as well, since Handshake is built on, um, you know, as, as it means to like resolve names. And this GUI is built on top of Chromium with NWJS. So we'll be extending the GUI also with a bare bones browser implementation. So you can immediately fire up your GUI and then also start using your own node to resolve against Handshake and have basically the equivalent of Brave right from your browser, um, right from your desktop, which is really fucking cool. So this is just the, uh, the, you know, the, the, the minor GUI itself. It's very straightforward. Um, you know, there's not much to it once you get it up and configured and running. It's really sexy. Um, it, it's gonna live on the HNS Pool website and on the Handshake Alliance GitHub, which I'll show you now more of in a second. Um, so we have, of course, like the Handshake Alliance, right? An organization with a lot of like, really cool partners um, from multiple different companies as I described. Worked on the Alliance site, the pool, the academy, the block explorer, the indexer, another full node, the stratum, the command line interface, interface uh, an HS client, and Go, uh, an open source search engine for searching TLD so that no one can collect all your different searches and then buy a name against you, right? You want to be able to do that privately. Um, uh, more, more wrappers for just for like man handling handshake names, things like that. Um, and then, of course, like the pool, when you're mining to the pool. Um, obviously, you need a centralized like location to kind of like know like what's going on. So the pool, which will launch here in the U.S., and everyone that will fire their stratum at the pool, both U.S. and Chinese-based partners, um, of which kind of the largest partners are going to be here based in the U.S. So we're very excited to have a pow chain with the majority of the hash rate here. Um, so that's kind of really cool. So you can come into the HNS pool anytime. You can sign in with your like your stratum like ID, like login and password and stuff. Not everything is implemented right now. It will be over the course of the next week. Um, and you can see like historical hash rate information, da 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 da. There'll be charts, so you can see everything. This is not loaded right now. You can see the last of the blocks, everything that's coming in, da 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 da. There'll be links to, excuse me, to the docs and et cetera, to HNS2 so you can get there. Um, so I spoke quickly about the Handshake Academy. I'm trying to breeze through everything now. This is the resource site where you can learn more about Handshake. Review the white paper, learn some more facts. Um, there's going to be a learning um, uh, part coming up soon to learn more about a, a DNS and kind of like how the normal web works. So you can compare and contrast that against Handshake itself. More links to all of our really cool stuff, our Handshake, the Alliance, the, the, all the cool services we've been working on. And then the last part, which is one of my favorite parts, um, is, the, is Apex, Bob Wallet. So there's two parts. There's Bob Wallet, um, and then there's Apex, which is the OSX resolver. So Bob Wallet is an Electron app that exists on your desktop, and uh, I'll fire up, fire up Bob here. So Bob is going to load up, and he's also going to be immediately syncing an HSD bundle node in the background as well. Um, and so what it is, is once you're synchronized, immediately by the time you go through the setup process, you enter in your seed word phrase, you create a new account, your, your, chains, your, your node's already synced with the network. You're, you immediately have an address. You can immediately start taking Handshake. So you can go into your backend settings. You can import a recovery seed phrase. So like say you know, you, you're part of the, you know, the process. You, you, mined, uh, you, you had your claim on the network from HNS scan. Now you want to get your tokens and go spin them, bid on names. You import your seed phrase or create a new wallet and, and load that from here. Um, you'll see your whole like, portfolio, your, like top level view spend balance, like, you know, just like when you sign into your bank. Um, you can send funds, all that good stuff, set your network fees. Um, it'll give you like an estimated time of delivery, uh, everything here, you know, there'll be, like, there's checksum, all that good stuff um, to make sure you're sending to an actual handshake address. Um, you can receive, so you can show your receive address, you know, when you want to send funds from your account. Domain manager, they don't have any domains on here right now for testnet, I should have preloaded it, but you can see all your domains here and there's a management where you can click your name, literally put in the name of where your server is and six hours later we'll update to the network and congratulations, you bought a name for a couple cents in HNS, you've now pointed to your own server, you have a website that exists on the decentralized web really fucking cool. And then obviously adding more funds. Um, so there's this, the, the process here will teach you how to redeem your coins as well. So whether or not you're, you're, you were, had the allotted 4,662 HNS that's in the Merkle tree as a GitHub developer with the, all the qualifications pre-listed below here. Or if it was the PGP Web of Trust, whichever one you did initially, you can click, click, redeem, go through that process, import your name, done. It's that simple. Um, you can browse like all the top level domains that are currently out right, right now. Like I can do a search for name base. I can see that it's, it's, it's available, there's been no bids, I can see that on the network, da 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 um, Then I can go to like all my pending bids, so like if I have like, it's in a reveal state, like whatever I do, whatever, it, it, will, it will notate and show me visually what are the names that I need to focus on. Um, and then finally like names that you're watching, if you just like want to uh, watch a name that someone else bought, like your name's Steven, someone else bought Steven, you want to see one day when that's available, you can see that here. Um, and you can also download your watch list and move it to another wallet on another computer. Um, so you can kind of move all that stuff around. 
So, you know, kind of as you can see at a high level, um, mining UX has been substantially improved. We're really excited about having US based pool. Awesome block explorer. I didn't even get to touch about the Urkel API, um, which will like work against the RPC for Handshake, which will be available um, in a week or so as well. You know, full node clients, everyone kind of like working to collaborate together, us being here in the room, and really focusing on like the, the front end, like product engineering of Handshake is extremely important. Uh, on top of all the other reasons that we believe that Handshake will be successful, I think one of the most successful parts is the fact that we've abstracted away a lot of the complexity, kept the brand language really similar, and kind of worked collaboratively over the past year since Handshake has been announced, like really make a whole ecosystem and a suite of tools that people can dive into, not just scratch their heads at for two weeks and think, hey, maybe I'll go speculate on name base. Right? They say, here's obviously clearly something I want. I want Handshake right now. I'm making a name based account. I'm buying this. I'm part of this new decentralized web. I'm buying my name on the network. Um, and it's, it's that easy. That's all I got. Any questions? Yep. Uh, is there any. Uh like marketing push to coalesce around like a particular TLD that's like a censorship resistant TLD? Like, a, like a dot com of, of uh, Handshake? Dot com of Handshake? You mean like just like Handshake slash? Like if that, who will, oh, I'm sorry, I'm not sure. I think that question. it's up to you to decide. Yeah. Like no one can really speak for If you if you want if, if you feel inclined to try that, then you, we definitely think that it would be cool for you to try that. If someone else wants to try it, two people are going to compete for it, and that's cool too. Like, yeah, you know, there's like you don't you really you don't really need to ask for permission. It's all about whatever you're interested in doing. But yeah, every, every name on Handshake is censorship resistant, so right. you don't necessarily need to just like follow someone else's CLD. You can you can register your own name, and, and no one will be able to take that away. No, I get that, but um, just for like mass market brandability, I like we saw it with like .dot coms. Like there's a move towards most websites are on .dot com, and like people think of a .dot com as a website. Yes, I think implicit in this discussion we're having here is will people continue to use names in the way that they're used to, which is I register a subdomain, I own a subdomain on top of a TLD. And I think in a lot of our heads that have been you know, banging our heads against Handshake in the past while, we no longer think like this. We think, I want some name. I, don't, I never wanted the .com in the first place. I wanted that out of necessity. And now we're in a world where the TLD doesn't matter because you don't need one. You just get the name that you care about. Um, so it remains to be seen to what extent people will still care about subdomains, and that, that is something you can do on Handshake. Uh, but my personal sense is that people will just get their name outright. Mm -hmm. okay. and, and with like the, you know, kind of the fact that you can have like you know longer name spaces, you can get a lot more creative with the types of names and stuff you use online too. So wherein like we kind of like fell into this norm that everyone was like you have, when you're a legit company, you make sure you own the .com of your name, right? Kind of it's just like that's just how it fell organically. Wherein like Handshake, I just like I don't see anyone really corralling around like oh I really want to have a subdomain of this name when I could have my own, um, which is kind of the, like the unique advantage there. Um, what happens if like I register on Handshake um, like a dot Kevin and then I can decides to also sell dot Kevin's? Like, is there going to be a war? I think that really kind of touches on Anthony's point that he was talking about later, right? Like, if it's like something that comes down, it would be later in the future, and then we also have many years of Handshake's adoption between us and then. And we would hope that our continued relationships that we've had with some of these other entities that are kind of, kind of like kind of behind the existing DNS name that as we grow a popularity that we'll also be able to like work more like, closely together. Um, you know, ICANN is also, um, they're pre-allotted to have a certain portion of Handshake themselves as well. So uh, over time as Handshake becomes more valuable, they're also incentivized to work more nicely with us. I think the, the long-term goal is to make the user experience of owning a CLD on Handshake so far superior to the user experience of owning a CLD on the original system that everyone would opt into using Handshake instead of the traditional. Yeah, instead of setting up a bank account versus like just generating a Bitcoin address, right? It's just so simple. Why would you just not do one over the other? So in the future, it seems like the social network will be Handshake. Well, the I guess the, can the canonical worldwide global yeah. version of what is a name, sure. But I mean, that, that name could then be used interoperably on any, any well, social network. So the, the cool thing is, is that you're right. People will create systems of interoperability Oh yeah, just send money to fan. You know what I mean? And 
you'll there'll be some protocol where you look at the fan name on Handshake and then you see, oh, he's got a Bitcoin address and I've got Bitcoin, so I can just send him fucking money using that address. So I'm done, you know what I mean? So people can use this to build like higher level protocols for like any. Any other questions? Oh, and also um, the cool Bob wallet and everything that I showed you, if you go to apexhns.com, you can actually apply for the beta uh, and to get your hands on it. And it seemed like we were kind of just doing some more in internal kind of like fun, like testing with that until um, the developers feel more comfortable with that. Uh, but once that's available, we'll, you know, we'll put announcements out for that. And again, all the stuff that I showed you, it's, it's, it's in the form that it is now. Um, like if Handshake showed up in the next two or three days, we'd be ready to go. Um, and then, you know, obviously we just, until now on that mainnet date, we're just going to continue to polish, 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 and then see what else maybe we can, like, squeeze in before then. So, you know, again, like, kind of just, like, close up that thought here. It's like we believe the handshake is in a very, very mature, good, you know, very strategic position, not only in what it's seeking to do, but also the technologies and the stack that we're, like, providing, like, initially from day one. And with the incentives from the airdrop and everyone kind of having skin in the game to just be curious and having something to just be curious of, you know, we think that's very important. Wherein, if everyone had these airdrops and et cetera, and they're like, cool, I'm going to send them to an address, now I'm going to sell them, um, Handshake is just like an afterthought. Wherein, if I have something to actually do on the first day and I can see the power of it, I'm more likely to be entrenched socially into this ecosystem. And then, if the price of my assets increased, I'm now financially entrenched as well. ApexHNS.com. Okay. Awesome, cool. So that was everything. Um, I just had a quick closing note, and you know, really appreciate everyone coming out for this uh, first dev meetup that we made. You know, as you can see, it was a little bit more intimate, and we intended for it to be like that. Uh, I think you know the core idea here is Handshake's, Handshake's pretty cool because it, we're fundamentally we, we're given this opportunity to change how the internet works. Right? There's a world in which 10 years from now, this is how people are using the internet because it's an extension of the existing DNS. And the cool thing is, you know, when we talk with people who have been involved in the you know current DNS, right? People who invented TCP/IP, people who you know founded and started Open DNS, they they actually came out and, and talked with us about Handshake, um, and they're really excited about it because it, it's one of the you know, only it's one of the few hand, uh, blockchain projects that really makes sense, right? The existing DNS system it's mostly decentralized already, except for, except for that one part at the root, um, and it provides improvements along the existing DNS that are just like strict improvements, right? Like you don't you don't really get these security guarantees in the existing DNS that you do with Handshake, and then you don't have the flexibility that you do because there's so much bureaucracy in how current root TLDs are managed. Uh, but it's still very early days, as, as you can see. There's a lot of stuff that's already been built. Uh, you can use Namebase, you can use these other tools, and they're all available. But there's a lot of work that still needs to be done. Uh, and I think this is you know, kind of also serving as an invitation for any of you in the community who want to be a part of this. Uh, like, please reach out to us. There's so much projects that we can you know, put people on and start working on, and it's a really exciting time. Uh, and you know, let's just get cracking on it and start working together. All right, nice. And we have the space for you know some more time, so feel free to hang around, chat with each other, or go into the main hallway. It's all available. Yeah, like I th I think we'll probably want to do another one uh, once the mainnet date is yeah. set. It's, it's pretty close right now. Um, Mark and them, they just merged uh, some PRs to help with this like mainnet blocking wallet bug. Uh, so, you know, there's a lot of stuff coming. It's always hard to set an exact date. Everyone always asks, and it's like, you know, may maybe sometime this summer. 90% <laughs> sometimes this summer, but we'll see. Soon. <laughs> always soon. Yeah, but once that's locked in, we'll want to do a much, we'll do a much bigger launch. Um, you know, a lot of investors and whatnot, they always like reach out, and we try to keep this to be more debt focused, but then once the mainnet is set, we can drum up a little bit more hype. Uh, until then, we can just you know stay quiet and keep on building. Yeah. And also, if you can put your trash in the trash can. Yeah. Thanks, guys. All right. Nice. Okay.